Welcome to the Bay Area Case Studies Virtual College Fair. My name is Jasmine. I'm going to serve as your facilitator for our session today. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping announcements. The first, you can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any point throughout our session today. Second, your camera and microphone are off so we cannot see or hear you. Third, this is just one of many different sessions that we are offering, so feel free to visit our registration site to sign up for additional sessions. And finally, this presentation is being recorded and you'll have access to that recording within about a week or so. We have a great lineup of colleges and universities for you today. With that said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our first presenter, the University of Southern California. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Black. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am representing USC, the University of Southern California. You'll also see my colleague in the chat, possibly or on the screen, Nathan Mack. Uh, we are both really excited to go ahead and explain and really talk about all who we are here at USC. So just to start out, USC is a large private research institution. You'll see some facts and figures on the screen right now. We represent about 20,000 undergraduate students, but we do have a really small student faculty ratio. It's only about eight to one, with most average class sizes being 26. And with these small class sizes, you are able to interact with your teachers, your mentors, be able to really dive into the academic. And while these are just a bunch of numbers on the screen, I really like to share to you who we are here at USC. And first, I'd like to start with how we really approach our education here at USC. It's something we really see through the lens of something called interdisciplinary studies. This really does focus on you. You're you really seeking your undiscovered passions that might be kind of different from what you initially came in with. That means a computer science major could also study business administration, a dance major could also study architecture, things of that sort. Um, we have an open class policy, which means there's also a ton of opportunity for you to take classes outside of your major. And with the flexible curriculum, there's really no limit to that. USC does really focus on these interdisciplinary studies, and we actually create majors that are interdisciplinary in nature. For example, we have the Ivy and Young Academy that really combines um, ideas around technology, communication, but also design and computer science. So we really want you to come to a school like USC to, again, discover those undiscovered passions. Next, let's talk about research. Uh, USC is a research one institution and research really just means diving and discovering new knowledge. And you can do that within all undergraduate schools here at USC. We have over 150 majors and 150 minors. So yes, my humanities and art majors, you can participate in research. Next, let's move on to something we like to call the global perspective. We do not think that your learning and doing is really locked into the four walls of your classroom. We want you to go outside of the classroom and really dive deep into those subjects. Um, we have study abroad programs across plenty of continents, plenty of countries, and you're able to really go to those places and seek out different information for things that you're really passionate about diving into. Next, we can't not talk about the city of Los Angeles. So USC's campus um, sits on a huge plot of land about two to three miles south of downtown Los Angeles. So anytime you come visit USC, it's going to look like this picture here. It's going to be sunny and 75, but our students really do take advantage of the entire city. Um, you can go surfing and snowboarding all in the same day, but USC offers unique opportunities for our students. For example, we have a great program called Peaks and Professors, where students get to go outside of campus and go hiking or go take pictures of the Milky Way and Joshua Tree with our faculty. Again, really unique opportunities for our students. And that kind of segues into our campus life. We have a rich campus life here. And with over 20,000 undergraduate students, there's really 20,000 unique ways to have this be our own. Um, so students get involved with over a thousand student organizations, whether it's sororities, fraternities, political organizations, comedy, sports, whatever that may be. And students do get involved with sports in general. So um, students can get involved with like clubs and intramural. If you're interested in Quidditch, Quidditch is pretty popular here at USC. So there are a lot of great ways to take advantage of your USC experience outside of the classroom. And then, even though I'm talking very quickly, I cannot not talk about something called the Trojan family. The Trojan family is lifelong and worldwide, and it's not a blood-related family, but it's the community, the passion, the drive of our students and faculty that come through our doors here at USC. They're your support systems day one when you step on this campus and day 
whatever that may be when you exit this campus. They are really to help you out throughout your experience here at USC. And as I quickly talked about who we are here at USC, let's talk about our application process. Our application process we review, and you'll hear this through some of our other presentations, is something called a holistic review. Now I like to describe that as everyone on this call is a whole person, right? We review your entire, your whole application to find remarkable students who will add to the legacy of a school like USC. We never solely make admissions decisions based on like numbers or GPAs or minimums or something of that sort. We really do look at every single item you submit. That being said, each of our admissions counselors are territory managers. So we understand your school and what curriculum your school offers, whether it's AP, IB, dual enrollment, or none of the above. Our territory managers understand your school specifically. Just a quick note on some important dates. If you have your phone, you can definitely enter this um, in your phone now on your calendar. Um, we have two application deadlines. We don't have early decision or early action. December 1st is our deadline for those that are interested in being reviewed for a merit-based admission scholarship or if you're applying to one of our talent-based majors. January 15th is the final deadline for all of our first-year applicants, but regardless of what date you actually press submit on your application, you'll be reviewed in that same holistic manner. I talked very quickly about USC. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have. I actually review applications in San Jose, California, but if you have any questions, please feel free to put that in the chat, and if you want to find your admissions counselor, there is a link below. Uh, thank you all, and I'll pass it on to Bucknell and Fight On, everyone. Thanks for coming. And Jenny, you are on mute. Thank you. Whew. Rough day. Uh, thank you for the amendment. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Kim. I am the regional counselor for Bucknell University, and I am based out of San Diego, California, and I am your admissions counselor. I am a uh, proud alumna of Bucknell. So after graduating from Bucknell and working for other institutions for 15 years, I returned back to Bucknell about five years, six, almost six years ago to work for Bucknell because I just couldn't get Bucknell out of my system. To share a little bit about Bucknell University, we are located in central Pennsylvania in a town called Lewisburg. It's a quintessential college town, beautiful, where you can see your faculty walk their dogs. You'll have a meal and then you can see a staff member, you know, with their children, you know, dining next to you. So really it is a college town. Um, it's a safe town and um, our students are very intentional about choosing Bucknell for the reason that we are rurally located in central PA. So we have our, we have the Susquehanna River in our backyard uh, where students could go kayaking and canoeing, paddle boarding. Um, and then um, if students wanna go caving or hiking or rock climbing, they could do that as well. But if they wanna do a weekend trip to New York City, Washington, DC, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, it's only um, a two to four hour of a drive. So our students, who choose Bucknell are very intentional about wanting to be a little bit away from the hustle and bustle of a city and they are seeking for a lot of on-campus um, activities and events um, during their four years at Bucknell. We are a nationally ranked university, um, however we are a liberal arts, we have a liberal arts curriculum and our population, undergrad population, is 3,600 students. Um, at any given time of the year, we have anywhere between 50 to 60 graduate students. However, you will never um, really see them or know who they are because they are not teaching any of the classes, not leading any of the labs. All the classes and labs are, are led by um, professors, which means any professor who gets hired at Bucknell understands and knows that their um, you know, their attention, their focus during their time at Bucknell being a professor is given to our undergrad students, which means all the resources, the finances, the grants, the fellowships, research opportunities, presenting internationally at conferences, co-writing and um, co-writing articles and presenting is all given to our undergrad students. Uh, small class size, uh, faculty to student ratio is very low because once again, we are valuing and we are saying, you know, during your three, during four years or five years, depending on which program you're a part of, we want you to feel like you have a mentor that you don't just, you're not there just to learn and gain knowledge or graduate with a degree. Um, at Bucknell, we do have three uh, colleges. We have the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Engineering, and the Freeman College of Management. The College of Arts and Sciences is our largest college at 65%. 
We have over 50 majors within the College of Arts and Science, everything from before, um, theater, dance, um, Arabic, Arabic studies, uh, animal behavior is one of our uh, most popular program, I would say, just because of our primate center where we have four different species of primates that you can call your social friendly um, lab partner because you can do experiments with them as well. Um, and then within the College of Engineering, we have everything from biomedical engineering to environmental engineering, um, as, we're, as well as a five-year dual degree program. Um, if you're interested in getting a master's in engineering, you could also pursue that. And should you get accepted, your fifth year is free and you'll graduate with a master's. Our Freeman College of Management is our smallest. However, it is mighty because it is our business program. Our students are involved in classes where they're taking $2 million of our endowment and, you know, investing it and seeing what, what, uh, putting into practice what they're learning. So not our, not, um, our classes aren't just theoretical. It's not just textbook. We really want students to have hands-on experience in and out of the classroom. What is it like to live on campus? We have over 200 student organizations that you can be a part of. We are a division one school. So we have 27 sports that are D1 um, that you can be a part of. Majority of our students are involved in club or intramural. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be a D1 um, athlete to be involved. There's a lot of school spirit. Um, because of our basketball team and our football team. However, I think for me personally, I can say the school spirit comes because you're rooting on your best friend. Um, and you're just supporting your friends. So it's not about the winning, but that's what gets you to paint your face orange and blue at these games. So there's plenty to do on our campus. We have, you know, artists and entertainers. We have living and learning communities where 90%, 92% of our students live on campus. So once again, residential. Here are some statistics that we have. We are test optional. However, these are our statistics from the class of 2024. We went test optional two years ago. We will be test optional for the next two, uh, next three years, except for athletes, because we're part of the Patriot League. Um, so that's the only group currently, and this may change in the next few months. Uh, we do consider students uh, without test scores for a merit scholarship, it's by a self-nomination process. As you can see, we work with dates. We don't have early decision. We only have sorry, we don't have early action, we have early decision and regular decision. So um, if you're interested in Bucknell, um, you know, and you apply early decision, know that it's a commitment and it's a binding decision at Bucknell. Just a few pictures of our campus. It's beautiful. There's plenty to do. And um, if you have any questions, I will drop my information in the chat with additional information. Thanks so much. And I'm going to pass it on. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Sewell, and I'm here to talk to you today about Reed College. And so uh, on the screen, you can see a lot of fun facts that I think kind of um, speak to a lot of the qualities that, that Reed symbolizes, and hopefully more than I'll be able to cover in the, the time that I have. So a little bit about Reed. Uh, we are located in the city of Portland. We're about five miles from downtown Portland in a suburban Southeast Portland neighborhood called the Reed neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, the campus itself kind of has that nice blend between feeling, you know, close to the city center, but also kind of having that more quiet suburban backdrop. There are more trees than people on campus, which kind of speaks to the community being small. So we have about 1500 students. And the vast majority of those are prospective undergraduate students like yourselves, you know, who are pursuing a bachelor's degree. We only have one master's program and it's small. It's about 10 students. So our faculty really specialize in working with our first year and subsequently the rest of our undergraduate population. At Reed, all of our faculty teach all of the classes as well. And so with faculty to student ratios, you know, from 10 students to one faculty member, students really get to know their faculty through those personalized relationships. All of our first year students, um, by being a liberal arts college, you know, get to take a breadth, a wide range of different curriculum. So you'll get to take some humanities, some social science, you know, arts, and kind of really have a well-rounded experience during your time. 
All of our first year students take a required first year sequence class called Humanities 110, which explores the diversity of the humanistic experience. So you get to do that through a few different ways. We get to look at a few different cultures and civilizations, you know, from kind of more ancient times to more current, but you also get to hear from faculty from different disciplines. So you might hear from a music professor, and then you might hear from a historian, you know, potentially the following week as well. You know, so you kind of get that well-rounded, um, you know, introduction to liberal arts. During your sophomore year at Reed, this is when students get to declare a major. So, you know, you don't have to do that when you first arrive. You kind of get the chance to be exploratory. And then during your sophomore year, you get to work um, to figure out exactly what you'd like to focus on with your faculty advisor. Also during your sophomore year, about a third of our student body does a study abroad experience. You know, so we have a variety of different partners, you know, in multiple different countries. So if study abroad is something you're thinking about, it's definitely alive and well and kind of a healthy part of the read experience. All of our students also do a senior thesis. So there's a lot of opportunity to be involved in research, internships, and kind of get a lot of hands-on experience during your time, which does culminate in a, a senior thesis, which can have, you know, the written component, but it also could have an experiential component as well. You know, on the social community side, Reed is a residential campus. So we have about 75% of our student body, you know, living on campus kind of throughout their time at Reed. And one of the reasons I think that is, is because we actually only have about eight percent of our student body that actually is from our home state of Oregon. So we have a lot of students, you know, from California, from different states and, you know, different countries abroad that kind of represent the, the community that we have at Reed. And I think the residential aspect of that kind of helps to foster some of those relationships. We also are really mindful of being an inclusive community. And what I mean by that is we don't have any exclusive clubs or groups. So we don't have any varsity level sports. You know, we don't have any fraternities or sororities. So just to say that, you know, if there's an activity you're curious about or you're passionate about, you can experience that at Reed, whether that's hosting your own campus radio show, you know, you can do that. Um, or if it's joining our cheese club, which is a club that is as delicious as it sounds if you like eating cheese. Um, you know, or you could join the club we have called the Air Force that does aerial acrobatics. So just to say there's kind of a lot of ways that you kind of work to kind of build those aspects of community. The other piece I'd say about social community is that Reed really prides itself on having a strong relationship with the city of Portland, but also the wider community as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities for volunteerism, you know, in like the, the local community to the school districts to really kind of getting a lot of hands on experience and really trying to give back and leave the community stronger from when it was founded. On the application side, um, Reed does a holistic application review. So we have an early decision, an early action, and a regular decision. And we want to consider all materials and really get to know you as a person when you apply. So we're interested to see your transcripts, your letters of recommendation, your essays, and really hoping to kind of get that full picture from you. You know, we do an optional interview as well. So if, you know, interviewing is something you're thinking about, you can definitely do that if you apply to Reed. On the financial aid side, Reed commits to meeting 100% of demonstrated need. So we typically ask for two documents to be able to do that. One would be a FAFSA and the other would be the CSS profile. And between those two documents, you know, we can work to kind of figure out what your need would be for you to be able to attend. So if you know you're thinking about read or you're kind of curious, definitely don't let cost be a deterrent. You know, we work to kind of have a customized package for each student who is considering us. I'll send my contact information in the chat, but you can also get in touch with us at read at any time at at mission at read.edu. But I really appreciate everyone's time today and I will turn it over to my colleagues at Dickinson. Thanks, Grad. Hello, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my uh, name is Phil Moreno. I am the Director of West Coast Recruitment at Dickinson College. And if that's a name that you're not familiar with, that's okay. I know we have some larger schools here. And the reality is, is I work at an institution where students come from all over the world, but there are only 2,200 students. Um, I want you to know that if you find this presentation to be helpful and you want to learn more, I'm your contact. I'm based down in Southern California, so I'm in your time zone, and I would be the first one to read your application. But to really talk about Dickinson and understand who we are is to understand that Dickinson is literally created at the start of the American experiment. Six days after the American Revolution, Dickinson is founded intentionally about for engagement. 
And we'll talk a little bit about what makes Dickinson distinctive. But I also know that when you're looking at colleges, a lot of us can sound the same, right? Um, small classes. Uh, student Dickinson has an eight to one student faculty ratio. Average class size is 14 students. We send more than half of our students abroad sometime during the four year experience. This is a place where students have an opportunity to study academically what they wanna study, but know that it will be infused with a global context and sustainable solutions. And we've been doing that since we were chartered way back in 1783. Um, and so I also wanna talk a little bit about why you would choose Dickinson among all the liberal arts colleges that you might have the opportunity to choose from. And out here on the West Coast, liberal arts colleges like Dickinson are Occidental College, the Claremont Colleges, um, up north places like Whitman College, even Reed in many cases. But for us, I really like to say that Dickinson is East Coast academics with a West Coast community. And I think this building right here exemplifies why I say that. And that's because this is Old West. This is an iconic building in the life of a Dickinsonian. And in fact, the main tradition on campus is marching up those brownstone steps, signing into the college, and then four years later, signing out of the college down the brownstone steps beyond the limestone. But what's on top of this building, on top of that cupola, is actually an accident. The architect, when he left uh, Carlisle way back in 1792, had asked that what be on top of this building was a triton. But the local blacksmith had no idea what a black, uh, triton was, and so instead put a mermaid. And our students, rather than fixing it, being serious, they rolled with it and have embraced the mermaid as the unofficial mascot of Dickinson for 200 years. Um, but like I said, we're intentionally located. We were literally founded for engagement. We're at the time, two days horse ride from Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Baltimore. Today, that's about a two hour highway drive. We're in a small community of only 20,000 uh, folks in central Pennsylvania, but we benefit from having both the US Army War College in town, as well as Penn State's Dickinson School of Law and a very prestigious ballet school. So those all bring a diversity to this small little central Pennsylvania town that you wouldn't expect. But like I said, what makes Dickinson distinctive is in fact our global context. We were the first college in the country to offer something other than Latin and Greek. We now offer 13 languages. In addition to that, we run 18 of our own study abroad programs. You can see that we send our science majors abroad at almost twice the national rate, as well as our division three athletes. When you look at Dickinson, you'll find that we're actually a place that is known for sending students um, abroad for more than one semester. And then that other piece that we're very heavily invested in is the idea of sustainability. And at Dickinson, it's more and beyond environmental conservation. We talk about sustainability in all aspects of it. Um, you know, of course, we have a farm. Um, we have been named the number one most sustainable institution in the country. We attained that carbon neutrality in 2020. So lots of investment there. But I think our director for sustainability education, who just happened to share the Nobel Prize with um, Al Gore, was part of that group, will tell you that what he's most proud of in terms of sustainability at Dickinson is that of our 46 majors, students can choose 100 different courses that come from 40 of those majors. Um, so it's a place that is thinking about sustainability in everything that we do. And what's kind of neat is we too are interdisciplinary. Anything that's on this slide that says studies is going to be an interdisciplinary major and more than half of our students do that. And then another 30% will do a true on double major, um, the most common double major being paired with computer science. Next year, we're also launching a data analytics major. So we're constantly evolving. Um, and then that big piece that I think is really um, notable within the liberal arts is we guarantee you will have an internship or research before you graduate. We work with you to apply to law schools, medical schools. This is a place where you're going to have continued um, access to resources throughout your four years and beyond. So what do you do next? Well, you know, at this point, if you're a junior looking to connect, I'm setting up regional interviews. I'll throw some of that information in the chat here. As you're thinking about our admissions process, know that Dickinson had been test optional since 1994. This year, we became test blind uh, or test free. Um, we're still making that decision, but we will have always been and remain test optional in the process. Our two deadlines um, dates are November 15th and January 15th. Everyone is um, evaluated for merit scholarships. And if we do admit a student who has a financial need, we do guarantee that we will meet 100% of that demonstrated need. Lots of information. Uh, and I know that we have one last presenter, but I wanna thank you for being here. I'll encourage you to connect. Um, and I wanna throw it back over to another East Coast school, uh, Syracuse. Thank you, Phil. Thank you everybody for having us here tonight. I'll just share my screen. Okay, there we 
there we go. Okay, so my name is Camille Kreitz and I'm an Associate Director of Admissions for Syracuse University, which is located in Syracuse, New York. It is a mid-size uh, university. We have about 14 to 15,000 undergraduate students and we are a residential campus. So we do require our students to live on campus their first uh, two years. We are built up on a hill just outside of downtown Syracuse and Syracuse is a city. It isn't just a little college town. We have an airport about 20 minutes from campus. So from the West Coast, you can fly into any of the major uh, Midwest cities, East Coast cities, um, even as far West as Denver, those all have fl direct flights into Syracuse. So very easy to get in and out of. And we're about five hours North of New York City and about five hours West of Boston. So this shows you exactly where we are. We are right in the middle of New York State. Uh, so we're also very close to Niagara Falls. Toronto is another big city that is very close to us. Um, so uh, train station about 15 minutes from campus. So that's a great way to get down to the city if you want to go down for the weekend. Um, but just, uh, you know, very easy um, in and out to Syracuse. So we have over 200 majors and 100 minors divided up into 10 different colleges. And I mentioned that we have about 14 or 15,000 undergraduate students, but because we have the 10 different colleges, when you're in your classroom space, you'll only have about um, 50, uh, 25 students. Our average class size is about 25 with a student to teacher ratio of 15 to one. So you'll feel like you're in a much smaller school when you're in your classes. We have a common curriculum in the College of Arts and Sciences that everybody is required to take. And this creates some flexibility and allows students to apply to Syracuse Undecided, to pick up a double major, to pick up a minor, or to change majors altogether. Uh, so you have a lot of flexibility. You can also study across curriculums. So you could be an engineering major minoring in music or an architecture major minoring in retail management in our business school. Um, there's a lot of flexibility there. We are a tier one research institute. Uh, so when so students are encouraged even at the undergraduate level to get involved in research, we have um, not only academic advising, but career advising. So when you arrive as a freshman, you are also assigned a career advisor who will help you with internship opportunities, eventually jobs, but also uh, research and also graduate school, um, if that's something that you choose to do. So you have at least two advisors following, me, following you throughout the four years. We also have a top 10 study abroad program uh, with five of our own programs. And then we partner with local universities in over 60 countries. So at least half of our students do study abroad at some point, either for a semester or a summer program, or even for a short-term program. And then we're very diverse. We have students from all 50 states. California students make up our fifth biggest population on campus. We have over 300 clubs and organizations, D1 sports, Greek life, um, community service, student government, everything and anything that you might be interested in. Uh, we also have the Barnes Center, which is a health and wellness center on campus, which uh, includes a health center on the ground floor, a counseling center on the top floor, and four stories of athletic facilities, including a five-story rock climbing wall. Um, and that's right in the middle of campus. And then our Shine Student Center is where we have our food court. It's also where we have our um, intercultural collective. So all of our different cultural organizations are housed there so that they also can collaborate with each other um, when it comes to cultural events. And then just some of the nuts and bolts, we are a common app school. We have early decision, which is November 15th and regular decision, which is January 1st. Uh, we do a holistic review process this year and for 2022, we are test optional. Um, beyond that, we haven't yet decided. We do encourage students to do personal interviews. They're not required, but definitely encouraged. Um, it helps us get to know you, helps you to get to know us a little bit better. And we do have a commitment to affordability. So we are a private school, no out-of-state tuition. When you apply to Syracuse, you're automatically considered for merit. And then on top of that, you might also qualify for financial aid. So we have lots of different scholarship and financial aid opportunities. And what I'm going to do is I will drop um, some links into the chat 
for various virtual tours for internship or interviews um, and all of the various sessions that we're doing and also some of our summer uh, high school programs as well. So thank you for having us and I will end my presentation here. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. We are now going to transition to the Q&A portion of our session. So all of our attendees, continue adding any questions you may have in the Q&A section. So our panelists, feel free to return, turn on your cameras, and I'm going to pose a question to the group. First question is, can you give an interesting or fun fact about your school? And feel free to respond in the order in which you present it. I'll go first then. Um, again, Jamie Black from University of Southern California, USC. Um, I think some of the fun facts are like the movies and the TV shows that are filmed on our campus. Um, there's a ton, if you're familiar with Love and Basketball or Legally Blonde that was filmed on campus. Um, and we also have some pretty famous alumni as well. Um, so when the pandemic actually started, um, one of our alumni, Will Ferrell, you may have heard of him from Anchorman or some other um, comedy movies actually, gave a little uh, fight on message to our Trojans, noting that once we're all back on campus, um, that he might stop by. So uh, fun fact is that maybe the next time you watch a TV show or a movie, you might see USC in the background. So once we're back in person, once we can offer tours, definitely encourage you to come visit. I think we just lost. Jenny, Jenny should be coming back. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in just to just to keep things moving. So uh, Grant Sewell, Reed College, and I, I shared my, you know, more more trees than people fun facts. So I guess, you know, thinking of another one, um, you know, I would say, you know, we're one of the few, you know, um, colleges and universities that has a student run nuclear reactor on campus. So it is below our psychology building. Um, and I, I like to share that because I think it speaks to kind of the, the eclectic mix of like student interests, like our current coordinator is a history major. So you don't have to necessarily be physics focused if you wanna be certified to like work on the reactor or kind of be involved in that. But um, yeah, you know, kind of a, one of those little known facts. So just wanted to, to share that one. I'll turn it over to Phil. Yeah, fun fact, I think I shared with you the mermaid, which is fun. Um, but the other fun fact is I mentioned that one of the traditions is walking up the brownstone steps into Old West. Um, Dickinson's one alum who became president, James Buchanan, fun fact with him was he was expelled at one point and then readmitted. So his uh, name is actually in our roles twice because he was able to come back and had to sign in uh, both times. So um, a little fun fact about our presidential uh, uh, alum. Um, uh, so I guess we can go to Syracuse and then end with Jenny this time. <laughs> All right, that works. Um, so my fun fact is that Syracuse University has the only fruit as a mascot um, in the United States university system. So our mascot is Otto the Orange, and we are the orange, and we do bleed orange. And once orange, forever orange. So come to Syracuse, you become orange. And if you graduate, you remain orange. That never leaves you. So that's my fun fact. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so for me, I have an interesting fact um, for Bucknell, which I was pretty um, kind of like, what um, shocked about was we at Bucknell had our first. Uh, uh, Myanmar, actually, uh, Myanmar's first international student was a student at Bucknell University, which I didn't realize, and it was back in the late 18, um, the late 1800, like early 1900s, so I thought that was really neat that the first international student out of Myanmar um, was um, a student at Bucknell. Nice. Um, so next question here, and again, feel free to respond in the order in which you present it. What advice would you give someone going through the college search process? Um, some advice I like to give to our younger students in the college search process. Well, first one, 
that hopefully all of the folks on the call will agree is to take a deep breath. This is a really long presentation day. You've been looking at the computer for all day plus school. So know that it is not a race to the finish line right now while you're searching. It is no way a competition. It is a way to really for, to get to know other schools and how you can visualize yourself there. Um, so for those folks that are at the beginning of the process, I definitely recommend starting an app or taking notes on your phone. Um, that way you can start making notes of things that you've been involved with or things that you like. Four years from now, if you're like a, a freshman or a sophomore in high school, you may try to remember, oh shoot, what competition did I get involved with or what uh, organization did I get involved with freshman year? It could be really hard to remember. So if you start taking notes, whether it's things that you're interested, things that you've done, or maybe just notes of some cool colleges you've seen, that could help you along the college search process. And by the time you're a rising senior, really kind of get those written down and not kind of in the back of your mind. So that's just a quick note that I have for our college going students in the crowd. Uh, for me, I think, um... I know the process is, is definitely going to be overwhelming because there's so many wonderful universities out there. Um, and I think for me, I made the mistake of, I don't know if it's a mistake, but it's pressure where, you know, there's branding, there's kind of better known schools and, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody went there and they became this person. So you start looking into it. But, you know, my advice is, I think just kind of starting out with what am I looking for in terms of academic fit? You know, where would I thrive academically? Are we, am I, you know, do I currently attend a smaller school with smaller classroom that, you know, my transition to a smaller classroom would be better? Or you're like, no, you know what? I want to, I want to be free. I want the larger classroom. I don't mind. I thrive in that. Like, I, instead of looking at names of schools, try to figure out, like, this is where I thrive. And these are the type of schools that I think I would academically thrive in because as much as, you know, how fun it sounds or whatever it is, you're there because you need to pass those classes. You need to take the exams. You're going to write those papers. And if you can't do those things, you can't enjoy the rest of your student experience. So I know it's hard to kind of move away from what, you know, parents might say or cousins or whoever, but really try to think about where I might thrive academically, what I'm looking for and what best supports me because everything else will flow from that. I think those are both great pieces of advice Jamie and Jenny shared, you know, I think for me, you know, like, like you're kind of doing with these sessions, you know, I would reach out to the schools that you're interested in, you know, I think, you know, especially kind of in the, the time of the, the pandemic and kind of being in this virtual space, there's maybe a lot of ways to visit that wasn't possible before, you know, maybe that's sitting in a class or maybe talking maybe a little more organically with a professor, you know, or, you know, potentially speaking with like a current student who is maybe doing the college search process this past year and who can kind of talk about their experience or some things they learned or there's those kind of takeaways. So, you know, I think that could be a valuable thing to consider as you're kind of um, thinking about these next steps. I'll have something different this time than the last session, because uh, we already have some great advice. Um, I think one of the things that is neat about this college admissions process is really that it's a rite of passage and there are skills that you're going to be learning from this experience that will serve you for the rest of your life. And I think you have to recognize that you come from this place where you have incredible privilege with the counselors that you have, that they really support you. I mean, it's a wonder that you have so many colleges that are attending this four hour event two nights in the middle of yield season. And so I think what I would say is listen to your counselors, see them as your partner and your ally in this experience. They will put together a paradigm in which you will be able to handle this process smoothly. Don't be a procrastinator like me and wait to the last minute. Um, if you do all of that right, then you'll be able to pick that college based on what most students say, which is it just felt right. But you can only do that if you've done the work. Okay, that it's hard to follow this because you guys have all given a lot of good advice. Um, I would say, uh, kind of to follow up on what Grant said, is don't be afraid or don't be shy to reach out to college representatives like us. If, you know, if there's a school that interests you, reach out to us by email. Um, you know, let us know that you're interested. See if if we can set up a Zoom meeting, maybe an interview. 
um, you know, ask us the questions that you want to find out um, because every school is going to be a little bit different. So you can't assume that if you know something about one school, it's going to be the same at every other school you're looking at. So be sure to um, check in with us, you know, and, and that's what we're here for. Um, we certainly are happy anytime a student emails us to let us know that they are interested in our school. So we will try and get you connected with faculty or with students or, um, you know, with the right link on our website uh, and just give you the information that you need. So don't be shy, reach out. Great advice from the group. Thank you all for sharing. One final question. Again, we'll start with USC. What is your favorite event or tradition on campus? Great question to end the programming. I know we're coming up on time here. Um, so you might have seen me do this a couple of times in the presentation. Um, so this is USC's signal. It's called Fight on V for Victory. Um, it is the way we communicate with each other. It's the way when you're passing your friend on campus and you're saying hello or goodbye or good luck on your final or have a great day in class. Um, Fight on is, um, again, just something that is specific to Trojans and wherever you travel in the world, if you give someone a fight on and they're wearing like a USC sweatshirt, they'll definitely know. It's this big, again, Trojan family that we're really proud of and a big tradition when you come here and be a USC student. So fight on everyone. Awesome. Uh, so for Bucknell, it's kind of a tradition slash event that happens every year and it's called Canoe Battleship. Um, it's super exciting, not just because it's, you know, Canoe Battleship. So what could be more uh, fun than trying to sink each other in canoes in our Olympic size pool, but the fact that it's an all campus all staff, all faculty um, event, I think is amazing to, to say that um, I don't know how many students can say or trash talk their dean um, while, while trying to sink them in the pool. So I love that, you know, for us, it's all about that community. So um, I think all, everything is game when it's canoe battleship and it's a two day like semi-final, this whole bracket thing of sinking canoes. But I love the fact that it's not just student, it's an all student event, but it's an all student faculty and staff event that happens once a year. Yeah, and I, I know Reed's got a, a few fun traditions, you know, I'd love to share more about each of them, but I would say one that kind of, um, you know, jumped to mind when I saw the question was a week we have on campus called Paideia Week. And so Paideia Week happens every January. It's right before the start of our spring semester. So it's a non-academic week, but I think it really kind of speaks to the, the Reed ethos of learning for the sake of learning. So essentially during the week, anyone in the community can teach on any subject they want doesn't matter what it is. And I think you, you just see like different community members, you see their interests, you see their passions, whether it's a, you know, a, a fan uh, driven, you know, theme of a TV show to, you know, maybe something a little more academic. But um, I think that kind of really speaks to that kind of culture of learning that we really try to, you know, uh, live up to at Reed. So I'd say that's a fun tradition. For us, uh, my favorite tradition is this event that happens at least once a month where um, because the farm is about six miles away, students can bike to farm and when they get there, make pizzas, have bonfires, um, they've even put on productions. But the newest iteration of this is to actually bike to canoe to get to the farm because there's a river a runway of water that goes through the middle of the farm that is fun. I'm going to do it one of these days. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> My favorite event at Syracuse is something we call the May Fest, and it is a weekend long music festival uh, on campus and in the area just off campus. So everything from major events in our stadium, obviously that didn't happen this year, but um, you know, some sort of a major concert at the stadium down to uh, student jazz ensembles in you know, some little area of campus. So it's um, just a really fun time. There's a lot of food trucks out there. It becomes a whole sort of festival atmosphere. Um, and so it's just a lot of fun. All right. So now um, with answering our Q&A um, in the presentations, we are moving towards the close of our session today. I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, I do have a few closing announcements. So as you exit from this session, a survey will appear. It's approximately four questions, but please, please complete the survey. It's extremely useful as we aim to improve our virtual college fair offerings in the future. 
Also want to remind you that you can sign up for additional sessions by visiting our registration site. And finally, a recording will be available within about a week or so. Again, thank you to our amazing presenters for joining us and also to our attendees. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much.